Okay, so OpsPy. You saw in Stephanie's talk that she also mentioned OpsPy, that OpsPy allows or has some functionality implemented to do these array derived rotations uh, or general grade, wave field gradients, but there are also many, many other things in OpsPy. What I will talk about today are really the basics of OpsPy. Right? There is functionality like doing this array derived rotation thing, there is functionality like computing. Uh, or performing beam forming on your data and uh, lots of other things. But especially so because a few of you have not had any contact with OpsPy yet at all. Uh, I will talk through the main important things about OpsPy, give a brief demonstration how you can just very easily download data using OpsPy and then we will already head into the exercise. So this is hopefully much, much, much shorter than my lengthy presentation in the morning. Okay, so the four important, most important building blocks are time, how we handle time in OpsPy, uh, and then waveforms, metadata, and events, and we go through them again one by one. So let's start with time, right? We saw before in the, during the morning that OpsPy or that Python comes with a time module that allows us to uh, get for example, current time. If you have not seen this before, this what you usually then get is a so-called Unix timestamp, which is a floating point number that just counts up from 1st of January, 1970. So zero is 1970, first, uh, first of January, zero in the morning, zero o'clock, midnight in the morning, essentially. Right? And since then it's counting up, this is Unix time, and this is what you get here. So why do we not use this time functionality in OpsPy? And the reason for that is precision. That uh, I just, before we started, before I started this, I checked again uh, the documentation for time. And that says that like, if you do computations with times that come from, uh, come from here, the accuracy is only something like 50 to 100 Hertz. So, uh, what is that, uh, um, 10, 10 milliseconds or something is the precision of this. And uh, that's the reason why if you need higher precision, for example, you have a sensor that samples at a higher rate than this, uh, and then you have data at a higher rate than this, which is why uh, there's a date time module in Python, which previously, uh, so with daytime, you can then handle stuff like times and time zones and all of these things. And previously, up to recently, I think a year or two, daytime had a precision of microseconds, which is still not enough for what we may need with uh, sensor technology. If we have something that uh, uh, samples at, at much higher frequencies, so several kilohertz or whatever. This, these, all, these kinds of things we need to handle somehow. And this is why the guys at OpsPy developed their own uh, time module, which they called UTC date time. And we can just from OpsPy import UTC date time. And when we do UTC date time like this, just like we could do with time from Python before, we get a string representation of now, right? This is current year, current month, current day, then T denotes that, that now the time starts and then uh, the time in UTC, as the name suggests, UTC date time. It's also what the Z at the end here means. Uh, this stands for Zulu, which is military speak for UTC time, essentially. Uh, this is only like a representation of what we get, we may want this in other ways. We could also get this uh, from UTC daytime in form of this uh, Unix timestamp if we so want, but that's uh, not, not too relevant. Um, what may be interesting is creating time objects for different times than just now. And this we can do, for example, by specifying a different time, maybe the 11th of March, 10 years ago. And then I have a specific time in mind. Uh, 
5 in the morning, UTC time, uh, 46, 23 seconds, 0.2. And if we define this, we now get this representation, which is essentially the string we put in here, more or less. This is one of the ways how you can uh, give UTC daytime times. It accepts many ways of formats. What it also, for example, uh, accepts is uh, if we put here 14 o'clock instead of five o'clock, let's say we are working in local time, then we need to specify that we need an, that we are working in local time. By default, UTC date time trades everything as UTC. And we can do so, for example, by in the end putting plus nine hours, which then means that this was the local time and local time is nine hours ahead of UTC date time. It's just a different way of writing this essentially. And it, gives us the same object, right? It still gives us then what is the same representation. It's still a time that represents this time exactly. There are other ways of specifying uh, date times or UTC date times. We can, for example, also give it a, like a many, many arguments, which then go year, month, day, hour, minute, second, uh, and then decimal second. Or not? Yeah, okay. Uh, one, two, two, one, two, few, like this. Same thing again. We can also give it this Unix timestamp I was talking about, which, let me just copy paste this, which is this for this times, right? If you have it in UTT timestamp. Uh, in, in Unix timestamp. Again, same time, right? So this is just how we define times. Now, when we want to work with times, we can, for example, define this somehow, maybe like this, that we now have something called start time, which is this UTC date time. And we want to add one hour to that time. Then it's really simple start time and we add one hour and this is 3,600 seconds. Yeah, so when we add stuff to these UTC times or subtract or whatever, uh, this is in seconds. So this is one hour and this is one day. Right, and if we then check what the output is, it's yeah one day later. Or if we add one hour, it's six instead of five. Right. We can also do stuff like, uh, which I guess is obvious, uh, subtract time. For example, if we want to know how long ago was this, we could say UTC day time now, print everything again, now minus uh, the start time of this particular event that we defined here. And then we get how long this is ago in seconds, which may not be useful. So we could roughly uh, convert that to years, ten, a bit more than 10 and a half years ago. These times really, uh, in a lot of ways, these UTC day times really in a lot of ways behave just like numbers when you work with them. You can add them, uh, you can subtract from them. And the UTC day time is what all OpsPy functions expect when you define time. Either you give it directly a predefined UTC date time object, or you give it a string or number that it can pass into a UT UTC date time like here. And you can also then just put the string in there and then OpsPy will automatically convert this when it needs it uh, to time. Uh, but yeah, this is what all OpsPy functions work with. And this is like the most basic building block of OpsPy. Let's talk about waveforms. Uh, I stole this uh, figure from the OpsPy team. They have like these nice graphics uh, illustrating the concepts for each of these uh, things. And waveforms, meaning, for example, seismic data, uh, is organized in so-called streams and traces. 
And what that is, is essentially a stream is a list of traces. It has many of the functions that lists also have. And then every item in that stream is a trace. And then a trace actually represents seismic data. And the trace has then uh, two major parts. First is the data, this block up here, or the, the, the higher block. Uh, and the second one is, is the methods. The data is further separated into the data itself, which is really then the, the, the samples of your waveform. This is stored as a NumPy array, as we have seen before. And you also get some metadata that is in the stats. Metadata meaning stuff like, what is the name of the station? When does this uh, waveform start? What is the sampling rate of this waveform? Everything you need to uh, actually know what this data means that you have. And then it has methods really convenient uh, methods that allow you to directly work with the data. And we will see, we'll see a few of them in just a moment. And then in a the stream, there's just another trace and another trace and however many you want, right? And I have, if you also download this from GitHub, you will see that in this data folder, there's a data example that I prepared. And we can really read that really easily uh, with uh, from opspy read. That's all we need. This is the function we use to read waveforms and then we can give it, and this is, I think, the greatest strength overall of opspy. We can give it any format you can think of. Opspy can, it's not exactly true. I currently have a few problems with that, but every format that's uh, commonly in use, you just give it to opspy and it reads it, no problem whether that's an industry format or something you know, more exotic. Uh, there are many different kinds of formats like SegY, SegD, Seg, Seismic Unix, MiniSeed, you name it, many, many things. Opspy just reads all of that and handles all of them the same way and you always get back a stream object. And by convention, you can name it whatever you want, right? By convention, we call these streams ST. So we read it, and if I then just print the stream, what we get is a representation of what is in the stream. And this stream contains three traces, and then we get some information about what data we actually have. And this is the identifier of the station and channel. Then we have from when to when is this data, was this data recorded, what was the sampling rate, and how many samples are there in this data. Yeah, I said streams are essentially uh, lists of traces and you can treat streams in a lot of ways like you do lists. You can, for example, ask for the first item in a stream. And let me not print this here again. And then we will get this representation, which was the first item in the list, the first trace. And now it no longer says how oh, there are so and so many traces are in the stream. It's just a representation for the trace. You can also uh, do things with streams like adding uh, to streams. Right? This won't work, but let's, let's, for example, say I create an empty stream for whatever reason that contains nothing. Right? And then I can read this stream and to this new one, simply add it together. And this works. Right? And then it just has been added. And if we add it again, it's now two times in there. So really easy, easy to work with, easy stuff uh, as far as, as streams go. Right, so, but it, as we saw in this overview, essentially all that streams do are a container for all the traces that we have. There are some functions on there and I will show that in a moment. Uh, but essentially, uh, yeah, it's just a collection of traces. And we could, for example, extract this trace like this. Trace is then by convention, again, often called TR. And if we are, care about the first trace, we can do it like this. And again, get the trace. We can also just loop over all the, all the items in the stream, which means all the traces. 
and then we get three different prints for each for for one of the uh, for one of the traces in here. There are really convenient functions in on streams already. For example, we can just call stream plot, and then it will plot everything. Right? It will plot proper time from when to when this was recorded. It will plot, in this case, it's three components of a single station. It will label them and it will show us the data and somehow reasonably scale these axes and have proper uh, uh, axes and so on. And then up top, again, for overview from when to when this data was recorded. And in this case, it's, it's an earthquake. Right? Really convenient for quick exploration. Other things that work on streams, uh, some of these uh, down here, for example, are you can trim the data, right? You have maybe an entire something of data, but you only need a certain window for what you're doing next. And then you can trim a data by giving it a start time. And start time does expect a UTC daytime and an end time from where to where it should trim the stream. And let's put something, oops. Let's put something reasonable in here. Uh, so this was on 26th of, maybe from two o'clock. To 220 or something. And then we plot it again. Okay, my mistake. I'm not sure what. This is what I wanted to do. I think should have. Second. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. This this then works, right? And then we have cut the data to that exact time window that we wanted. The important part, if you're not familiar with this yet, is that this happens in place. Right? We just did it on the stream, and then we use plot stream as we did before. And now this is all that is left. All the data that did not fit this criteria is gone. We don't have it anymore. It gets removed. Which is why, uh, I guess uh, you could argue this with uh, the mutability, immutability stuff I talked about at the very beginning. Uh, but if you actually need to preserve uh, your stream and then go over many time windows that you want to cut one by the other, you again would want to do a copy of the stream before you actually cut it. Or if you don't alter the data, you can also use a function called slice, which then really just extract it, extracts the, uh, the data and gives you a new uh, stream without the need to copy stuff. Because actually this, when you lead and load a whole lot of data and then you copy it each time you want to cut a new window, the copying takes a lot of time. And this is quite slow. And then slice is good. But again, if you then change this data in some way by filtering it or whatever, it will also get changed in the original stream. Similar to when you change a list or another pointer to the list, it will change the original list. The same thing happens with streams. There you need to be careful. Yeah, we can do stuff basic stuff we can do, we can filter the data. We maybe low pass filter at one Hertz or whatever. So, which is not uh, useful because this is way too low. Let's say we want to look at, uh, I don't know, 25 seconds and and longer periods. 
what is happening. Yeah, okay, let's do 100 and longer. Then we actually can see that it changes, right? Uh, and this is the waveforms now when we remove all frequencies higher than 100 uh, seconds period or shorter than 100 seconds period. Again, this stuff happens in place. The data is now altered. And if you want to m work on your original data again, you need to read it again. Or you need to make a copy before you do this stuff. Other things you can do uh, is, for example, you can uh, decimate data. Decimating uh, means, so let's start with this again, right? So we have the data in 10 hertz and 20 hertz sampling, but maybe we don't need 20 hertz sampling, right? We're only interested in frequencies below one hertz or something. Then all the stuff that we record above one hertz, we don't care about, and it slows down all the computations we will do. And then we can decimate uh, the data, for example, by 10, which means take only every 10th value, essentially. And if we do that, now the data is sampled at two hertz. Again, it happens in place and alters the data. By default, there's no copy. This is roughly equivalent. It's not, it's not doing the same thing at all, but you can also use a resample function, which also allows you to upsample, for example, which for whatever reason you may want to do. Yeah, these are basic functions that OpsPy has when you work with waveform data. All of these functions that I've shown also work on uh, the trace itself. Right here are a few. One, some of these are list functions, but some of these are uh, as that we have seen before. For example, the decimate one, right? We just used on the stream, but it's also it just propagates it through all traces if you do it on the stream. A hint or something to mention if you have not encountered this kind of thing before. This is the so-called ID of a of a trace. If we just print the ID, just so you know what this means. This is like the standard uh, uh, notation for identifying channels of stations. And the first, uh, usually two letters before the dot are the network code. IU is like the international IRIS, international station network all over the globe. Then the station name, GRFO stands for Grafenberg Observatory in Germany. Then after the dot here, there is nothing. Sometimes there is something, usually something like 00 or 10 or 20 or something. This is a location code. Location code means that the station name refers essentially to which, uh, if, if you so want, which, yeah, which station is it in the sense that which room is it in or what is the, what is the premises of where the station is located. And then within these, maybe you move your sensor at some point to a different location. Or maybe you have multiple at, uh, which you shouldn't do, but sometimes people do that. You have multiple stations in the same room uh, that you then just give different location codes. Most of the time this is empty, sometimes it's not. And then it's, I guess, just be careful what you're actually looking at. And then the last one is the channel identifier. There's some convention. You can find a huge list on how this is uh, structured. The last letter uh, is which component this is, in this case, east component. The first letter is what the sampling rate is, roughly. B means something like 20 hertz, but it can also be 40 hertz. L means one hertz, but you also sometimes get five hertz. Uh, H usually means 100 hertz, but sometimes 200 hertz. It's just a range of sampling frequency uh, that you get. And the H in the center identifies what type of sensor this is. And H means broadband seismometer. You can find that stuff online. I think it's if you want to search for it, it's like uh, mini seed station identifiers or something like that. Just so you're so you're aware of that. Right, so this is really simple how you read data uh, and look at data. I mentioned that 
uh, data is structured into two parts, into data and, and stats. Let's first look at stats. So if we just print what the stats are, we simply get like a nice representation of all the things we need to know, right? Stay, this is essentially the ID, network station, location, and channel, then what the times are, what the sampling rate is. And often, depending also on the data type you're reading, uh, you will get an additional header, header word that then contains a lot, can contain a lot of information. Like SecY data, for example, is notorious for having like hundreds of entries in, in their headers, which then all show up in like a separate one. And the data is simply that, the data. You've seen this kind of uh, representation before. It's just numbers one after the other. And if we look at the type, it is really just a NumPy array as we have used it above before. This is how data, like waveform uh, data works. Let's talk about metadata, uh, so-called inventories. Uh, you will notice a trend. A lot of things work the same way, where inventories are a list of networks, which are a list of stations, which are a list of channels. In OpsPy, they often use this logic of creating their fundamental basic uh, blocks. And inventory contains uh, all your station information. As you saw on the waveform data there, we only get the identifier, which station does it belong to. But we don't get information, where's the station located, uh, how is the station oriented, or what elevation is the station at. For this stuff, we have inventories. And again, I put an example, so from OpsPy, and now we use a different function, it's called read inventory. By convention, Inventories are called int, read inventory, data. And here I put an XML file, which in this case is a station XML, which is the current standard for uh, defining station information. Before that, there's existed stuff like response files and other things. Uh, currently, what people use are station XML files. Maybe that will change again in the future, where we will see. And if we just print the inventory, we get what is in this inventory when it was created, which was last week when I prepared this stuff. Who I got this inventory from. I downloaded it from Iris. And then what information is actually in here. So we do have a network in here. And I said inventories are lists of networks. So the network is the first item in the inventory. And let's not print the inventory again, just the network. Then we get, okay, network, are you? And then we get already a bit more information. For example, what this network is in like a usable name for people. It's a global seismograph network of IRIS and USGS. There are in total 127 stations in here, in this network, but I only have metadata for one because I only downloaded it for one. Network was established in 1988 and access open, so you can just go and download these data. And then in this network, there are stations. So let's look at the first station. Different representation again. Station GRFO, what the code is, how many channels exist in total, 45, which is quite a lot. Uh, this does not mean that there are 45 by three uh, seismometers, but this is stuff like then there are channels with different location codes. Uh, there are also you can, they don't only provide maybe BH data and LH data, but maybe also HH data and so on. All of these is then a different channel. I have here information for six. Uh, this station was installed 1994. And this metadata is that I got here uh, is valid quote unquote, up to this date. Uh, again, the data to it, the access to it is open. Now we finally get where the station is actually located. Latitude, longitude, elevation, and then we have which channels there are. 
and let's look. Also, stations are simply a list of channels. So let's look at the first channel. Uh, and then we get information about the sensor itself. Channel BHA, no location code. Uh, from when to when this was supposed to be valid. These are not always trustworthy these times here. Sometimes they are put here erroneously. Uh, yeah, latitude, longitude, elevation, and then here sometimes you find local depth, which is uh, if stations are put uh, uh, look or installed in a in a mine or something. This is then uh, how much below Earth surface, which is two hundred and sixty eight, is this actually? Azimuth and dip tell us what uh, how the motion that was recorded is is oriented. So BHE is the east component and the azimuth is 90 degrees from north clockwise. So towards east and dip is zero. So it's horizontal, it's the east component. For a vertical component, it would be zero azimuth and minus 90 degrees from horizontal or something. Or 90 depending on which uh, with your right hand or left hand system that also differs between sensors sometimes. And then your yeah, sampling rate, then what the actual sensor is, what its name is, which hopefully is never relevant for you, but it may if you run into troubles. Because what uh, these providers where I downloaded this from also provide is response information. Stephanie talked in her talk about that uh, like ring lasers have a flat instrument response meaning that uh, no matter what frequency you look at, uh, your sensor does not actually change the relative amplitudes you, you uh, record or also and also introduces no phase shift. Seismometers work differently. Seismometers do this. Uh, they always have like a so-called corner frequency or natural frequency up to which they have a flat spectrum. And then they usually go downwards, meaning that lower uh, frequencies are in your uncorrected data represented with lower amplitudes than they were actually recorded or that they should be. And to re re correct for the essentially the effects of the seismometer and digitizer and everything, we get in response information. Most of the time, almost always, this response information is correct. Sometimes it's not. I just mentioned this, that maybe you will run into this where you're thinking, why the hell does this data not look right? Why are my amplitudes 10 orders of magnitude too high? Maybe the response is wrong. There are, for example, in Slovakia, permanent stations that have been in place for decades that still have wrong instrument response uh, when you go download it. And nobody seems uh, to fix it even after telling them. So. Just be aware that you may run into problems like this. And there may be reasons. The reason may be, most of the time, if you run into an issue, the reason is that you did something wrong. But sometimes it's that someone before you did something wrong. Inventories also come with convenience functions. Like we, can, we can plot it, which we can, again get the Cartopi errors. And then we'll plot a world map of where the station is located can be useful. Yeah, I will not go into how the instrument response is actually defined or how that works with the poles and zeros. That's an entirely new, uh, new thing. It's just an everyday use. You can just download it and correct for it and you're done. Events. The last building block, so we had uh, a time series in, in the forms of waveforms. We had metadata, which were the stations that recorded these waveforms. And then we have events, uh, which may be earthquakes, but also may be different things. By default, this is kind of designed for earthquakes, but you can define events as you wish, depending on what you will work on, maybe as a passing train or something. When you know the exact time for that, you can also use events for that. Um, again, as always in OpSpy, more or less, a catalog is a list of events. 
and each event has some uh, properties, origins, which are all the solutions that exist for where this earthquake was located or this event was located. You may get multiple ones depending on from where you download this because different agencies get different earthquake locations when they do their solutions. And then each origin has stuff like where was this earthquake, at what depth was this earthquake, uh, at what time was this earthquake. Events also contain information about magnitudes. What are all the magnitudes that we have available? What is the value of the magnitude? What is the type of the magnitude? All the things you may want to know. You can also associate peaks with events. If you have like from somewhere travel time peaks uh, on, on certain stations. If, for example, now from, from one of your stations that you're working on, uh, the event already has a peak travel time most of the time then by some agency that automatically or maybe sometimes by hand picked when this earthquake arrived, like a P arrival, S arrival, stuff like this. And similarly, focal mechanisms relate very much to origins and magnitudes. Uh, it's then uh, about what type of uh, mechanism was this earthquake actually. Which if it's a focal mechanism solution, meaning a pure strike to break search essentially, it will be in focal mechanisms, but you also nowadays, of course, most often get moment tensor solutions. Um, and again, there's a convenient function to handle these things. Now it's called read events and we get a catalog when we read from what I sent this with uh, the Sumatra what I call Sumatra Quake ML. Quake ML is a format. Uh, it's also an XML format designed. It, it's somewhat new. I think a few years only designed to incorporate all the information you would want to know about an event. And let's just look at it. Right in this catalog, there's one event on uh, 26th of December 2004. It's the Sumatra event with a magnitude of nine, moment magnitude of nine, and uh, and the location where it was located. We can also, as we had with the uh, with the inventory, just with this one command, plot a map of where this earthquake was located. Uh, if you have a lot of events in your catalog, you will get a map of lots of uh, dots wherever you have events. Right, this is just a super simple example with only one. And an event, again, catalog is a list of events. And if we look at the event, we can check what we actually got when I downloaded this. So event type, this is an earthquake. It may be different things if you work on different, if you work on other things. Uh, yeah resource ID where on Iris FDSN or which query exactly produced uh, this earthquake information. And then you have event descriptions, origins and magnitudes. And we could, for example, look at the origins. Well, let's do it like this. And then we have a list of, uh, in this case, it's only one and let's do it more prettier, more pretty, uh, just prettier. Right, let me print the origin. Doesn't is not prettier, okay? But in here, it's uh, what time was this event? What's the long longitude, latitude, uh, latitude? What's the depth? Who is responsible for this location? There's also a moment tensor. I think. Yeah, that's no, I just went again. Yeah, we didn't get a moment handle with this, All right? But we can also, yeah, magnitudes. What are all the magnitudes that we have available? And you may get different ones, right? In this case, it's magnitude nine type moment magnitude, MW. And for this responsible is Harvard. This is how you can uh, 
essentially organize events and stations uh, when working with Python. Yeah, these are the main building blocks of Python without talking about, or of OpsPipe, without talking about all the things they can do. I would suggest to read the documentation for all the things they can do, right? But uh, the data I have shown just before, like the waveforms and the catalog and the inventory, I have downloaded using OpsPy. And I just want to go through showing you how that is done, because that's also then the first part in the exercise to download the stuff for a different earthquake, essentially. So seismologists, as you may already be aware, are usually quite open with the data and services they provide. I would say for most stations that exist, you can just go and download it somewhere. Uh, one big challenge is knowing where to download it and how to download it, but and what even exists, right? But uh, there are like decades of history of sharing protocols. And it's in in a state of uh, being changed again a little bit at the moment. Uh, what you may find in other people's code, if you like from just a year or two ago, is that they use a service called ArcLink. ArcLink... Uh, I think f some providers still answer to ArcLink requests and OpsPy also still has ArcLink functionality, but this is being deprecated. Everything is being moved to FDSN. Uh, FDSN stands for the Federation of something like Digital Seismograph Networks or something like a international uh, collaboration of standardizing the whole whole thing. On the FDSN website, you can also find a list of all networks and all stations that ever existed and search. And the client we use is conveniently also called FDSN. So if we look at uh, clients that are available in OpsPy, clients meaning clients that we can use to ask servers that sit somewhere for data, there exist a few. I mentioned ArcLink here, but there are other things like Sinjin or uh, Earthworm or whatever. But what by now almost all uh, services use is FDSN. And then from FDSN, we import the client module or client uh, class. We create a client and then we need to specify where, which service do we ask for our data. Do we ask, I don't know, Iris or GFZ Potsdam or INGV in Bologna or IPGP or who, whoever is uh, providing data to people? By default, it's Iris, but it's useful to uh, just put something here to know, be explicit about what you're doing. So let's say we want to ask Iris, so US-based, for data. And then getting this data is really simple. Right? We use the client to get events and then we need to specify what events we want and let's say we give it a start time where we use the again utc date time and we know of a large earthquake that happened 2004 uh, start time on the 20th of december and end time the 30th, maybe we know somewhere around Christmas, there was a large earthquake and we know that it was actually quite large and ask for a minimum magnitude of 8.5. And if we then run this, wait a second, because the server needs to answer our request, we get this catalog. So this was essentially two lines initializing the client and then one line asking for uh, earthquake information from the data, uh, from the data center of Iris. This is the exact command I used to get this catalog we looked at before. And it's, it, it keeps being this easy, right? If we now want to ask for stations, 
we ask for get stations. And again, we need to specify some information. This can be any time, right? We need to specify some information from when we, the station should be in place. And we know it should be in the same time frame at least. And let's say we know which station exactly we're looking for. And we ask for the station is in the IU network. The station itself is called GIFO. And are done. Uh, things that are important here is with uh, these things here, and also I skipped over this when reading uh, files, uh, for example, what was here, OpsPy allows the use of, of wildcards. Wildcards meaning you put a star, like you do in Unix syntax, when you ls everything in a directory or something. And this will read everything that matches this pattern. And we can use the same thing uh, when asking for data. We can, for example, ask for not only just one station in this network, but all stations in this network. And then we get uh, that fit this, this constraint, right? That they were installed in the station. And then we get an inventory that contains now still the same network, but 74 stations. all kinds of stations, but it's not something we want. It's just so you know that this exists. What is now important to note is if you look at the inventory we had before, let me just again print it here. Here we had information about network station and the channels. And then in the channels, we saw that we also got information about the response. By default, you don't. By default, which is here, so we ask for the stations. By default, you get the network, the station, which then lets you know where the station is located, but you don't get any information about the channels. To get more information, you need to ask for more information by specifying a channel, uh, a level keyword. Let's say we want to have one more level, the channel, then we now get channel information. And then uh, inventory network station channel. So let's look at the first channel. It does come uh, with response information as well. This changed, this used to be different. It didn't come with this before and there was and maybe other providers do this as well. Also the level response that you for sure get your instrument response if you need it, if you need to deconvolve the instrument response. Right, you're noticing every time I run this cell, I send a new request to the server. And for most requests you send, nobody will complain. Uh, and you can run them again and again, but it's also, uh, like being funded by public money, by, so be aware of the kinds of requests you send, I would say. Because we can, like let's say, querying just a catalog of earthquakes or an inventory of stations, that's like minimal amount of data information. But you can also uh, download data directly from these data centers. And if you uh, specify If you give it uh, a request, which is very large, it, if you make a mistake, it's super easy to, for example, by accident request 10 gigabytes of data or something. If you just make an error in the year you, you provide or something. Right? And to some degree, they will provide you with data, but at some point they will just tell you, yeah, sorry, your request is too large, not answering this, make it smaller. And for if you intend to download a lot of information, uh, there's a function and you can check the documentation if that is something that rep replies for you. There's like a bulk get waveforms function, which then automates the process of uh, 
putting the request into smaller chunks and asking for one after the other. Right. But let's say we ask for uh, the data for the station, all location codes and all channels that match this. So wildcards also work like this, where we want BH data and all of the components. And then we, what we need is a start time and end time. And we can, for example, use, right? We got the information about the end event from the catalog we had before. And then we can just use the catalog, the first event in here, all the origins, the first origin, and then the, the time of that origin. So the earthquake source time and the end time is maybe two hours later. And when stream and run it, wait a bit, you see that takes a second because we need to download it and then we have the data. And now we have the data. This is the same as if we have would have loaded it from disk. This stuff you can also find, of course, explained on the, uh, because it is like the first task in the task, can can find in the, uh, on the ops file, on the ops file website, well explained, if you just Google for it, essentially. Now, just one thing to note, how did I then produce these saved files that I shared, that I use here and share on GitHub? For example, this, the, uh, Waveform data, I write like this, where I then specify a path, which was in data, and then I it had this name before, but I can give it whatever name I want, right? Doesn't matter. Uh, I give it which format it should use, maybe mini seed, maybe something else. Wait a second. It shouldn't take this long. Okay, it's done. The request for some reason uh, took a bit longer. And now I could uh, uh, not open. Read if I check what is actually in this folder, this, fa this file now exists there. This is how I did it, right? Same thing works for the inventory. Same thing works for the catalog. Just with different uh, so, right inventory is usually a station xml which is usually just an xml ending and then quake ml station xml quake ml that's how i did so that's how you can really easily get data that you want final thing i thought was would be worth mentioning is uh you may get error messages instead of data you may get back error messages from the server. And there are two that I think are useful to understand what they mean. So let's again uh, use a client, but now I'll use a client by a different provider, maybe BGR. BGR is a organization that Stephanie works at. Uh, so the German, whatever it was. Uh, in Hannover and let's uh, ask them for data, right? We are asking, let's ask them for the exact same data maybe, just as, let's just copy paste this, what we had, had here, make the exact same request to BGR, which I think may be a reasonable request, right? We know the station is located in Germany, so maybe the German data center has this data for us. But if we try this, they will tell, Oh, sorry, forgot this. If we try this, they will tell us no data available for request. They don't actually have this data. This is what you get when they don't have this data. This can mean that they don't have data for this station at all, or it can mean that the settings you put here, for example, that they don't have data for this specific time window that you asked for, or for these specific channels that you asked for. You will then always get no data available for request. To find out which station you can download from which data center, you can check out the FDSN website. That's fdsn.org. 
And if you then search for the network and then th there's a list where it's explicitly written which uh, data center does actually host this data for you. Another error you may get is when we asked just for events, right? All we wanted to ask was what are the potential uh, earthquakes that fit these conditions? And if we ask BGR this, and now we let's skip this. If we ask BGR this, we also get an error message. And the error we get, the client does not have an event service, meaning BGR does not even provide the, at all the possibility to download event information from them. There's no clean way of knowing which service provides uh, this, uh, these services and which doesn't. IRIS is always a good bet for uh, international stuff. Uh, and at least for waveform data, the FDSN website tells you exactly who hosts what, what kind of data. <laughs> 